Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Cuban-born jazz drummer Ignacio Barroa. He was born and raised in Cuba, and he's on the heels of releasing 2017 Straight Ahead from Havana. His musical education at the age of 11 really began at the National School of the Arts and really took off after he came to New York City in 1980 after leaving his country and at that point he was introduced to Dizzy Gillespie. In August of 81, Gillespie invited him to join his quartet and since that time he has only been more successful and he is always doing some straight ahead and some mincing of that jazz drum and he's one of the most popular and one of the only ones to really make it as a straight ahead drummer from Cuba. So please get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Thank you for taking some time out for me today. It's a pleasure. Same here, Ren. So let's go ahead and dive in here, your latest album, Straight Ahead from Havana. Talk to me about this album. How It's a great listen. I've, I've had some time with it. How do you feel about it? I feel very happy in my humble opinion. Uh, it is a great album, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy with the results, man. I'm very happy. And my idea, uh, you know, my, my my passion is jazz. I'm just a Cuban-born guy who loves to play straight-ahead jazz. So I I started my discography late because uh, I want to be ready. So I started my discography when I thought that I was a jazz drummer. So uh, among my discography, I'll, I'll, if, if I die tomorrow, I hope not, I wanted to leave uh, a straight-ahead jazz album, but I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to do another straight-ahead al- album playing standards, that something that everybody has done, and that's why I I pick the, the Cuban tunes, because that's something I had in my mind. So, well, how about changing the, the, the phrasing, changing the feel of this tunes that I used to listen when I was a kid and do it as a straight ahead album. But also with the, with the Afro-Cuban influence because rhythmically speaking, everything came from Africa. Yeah. So the drums, the, the, the trap drums, which is an American invention, it is an extension of the, the drums, the African drums. So I wanted to do that, um, and it came out great. I'm very happy with the results. We went to the studio to play. It is a straight-ahead album in a sense that nothing was preconceived. Uh, you know, we, we didn't explode, um, exploded uh, the technology. So we just went and did two tracks, or three, uh, three tracks, and, okay, we picked the best one, and that's it. Beautiful. Well, speaking of your roots in Cuba, talk to me about your childhood and how you got so involved, not only in jazz, but in drumming. Uh, I'm coming from a musical family. My, my, my grandfather was a musician, and my father is also a musician. I have uh, another uncle who also was a musician. My grandfather used to play the flute in formations in Cuba called charangas. It's a typical formation in Cuba with three violins, piano, a widow timbales, conga drums, and three singers. So my 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 grandfather is coming from that era, and then my father played the violin, and another uncle played the flute. So since I was a kid, I was surrounded by that ambient in my house, and also my mom. She was a music fan, and always had the radio on in, in my house. So I was exposed to music since I was a kid. Then later on, my mom wanted me to be like my dad. She wanted me to play the violin. And I started fooling around with the violin. Unfortunately, uh, my mom passed away when I was 10 years old. And um, my father started taking me to his recording. He used to be one, uh, he used to play with the regular National TV Orchestra. So he used to take me to the recordings every day. And that's when I started, you know, be more exposed to music. But one day, my father brought home an, an album, two albums, Nat King Cole Trio. And when I heard the guy singing, I fall in love with jazz immediately. No drums, just the Nat King Cole Trio, piano, bass, and guitar. And Nat King Cole made me fall in love with jazz. And then the second album I heard was a Glenn Miller Orchestra with, with uh, Gene Krupp on drums. And I fall in love with that album, and that was the album that made me switch from the violin to the drums. 
But one thing that I, a lot of people in the United States and uh, maybe in, in other places in the world don't know, I went when I went to study music in Cuba, I was a classical training musician, classical trained musician. In Cuba, there is no such thing of going to a conservatory and having a drum teacher. So I went to study my snare drums, and that was it. I learned to play the drums by myself. Nowadays, even nowadays, in 2017, you go to Cuba, and there is not a place where you can go and study jazz drums. I was trained, I was a classical training musician, and then I went to the army, and I started playing the drums on the street, like on local bands and on my neighborhood, things like that. I um, learned by myself and by watching all the drummers in Cuba and by listening to the few albums that we have, we had access back in those days due to the political situation between Cuba and the United States, no relationship for 50-something years until, I don't know, three years ago when Obama uh, made the approach. So it was very hard to be a jazz musician in Cuba. Then in 1980, I moved to the United States. And a year later, got the gig with Dizzy Gillespie. Sure. That's where I think, uh, that's where my jazz career began. When I started playing with Dizzy, I would say 19, 1982, summer 1982, even though we played uh, on December of 1981, I played one gig with him at a club in New York. Due to the recommendation of another Cuban musician, Mario Bausa, who was the guy who gave Dizzy Gillespie his first big break. Beautiful. So I always hear that Dizzy is an amazing human being. What kind of impact did he have on you, not only as a musician, but as a, a person? Dizzy Gillespie had a huge impact in me as a person because he reinforced in many, in many aspects what I was taught in my house. And the main one is something that unfortunately we are losing nowadays and is respect. <laughs> being respectful to people, uh, being humble, even though in this business most of the time when you are humble, people get confused. But yeah. uh, this is reinforced that. Uh, this and I, we became very, very good friends. We were very tight, and uh, he just, that's what I think about this, the type of human being he was, he used to, he respected everybody, treated everybody equally, from the president to a uh, garbage can collector. He would treat everybody with respect, and that's my approach. I treat everybody with respect, I pay attention to everybody, you know, and so that was the main impact that D.C. Gillespie made on me. The second thing is, he taught me a whole deal, a great deal of how to play straight ahead jazz. And all the stories and everything he taught me about phrasing, uh, so forth and so on, how to comp. Um, he taught me, it was like a going to the university. Yeah. It was like a going to the greatest jazz university in the world. Wonderful. You know, you've you released a new album. You've had a long, fruitful career. How do you feel about your career up to this point in your life? Are you happy with what's going on? Man, well, I guess I'm very happy. I'm very happy from my point because, listen, a guy from Cuba, I'm a Cuban guy, that my biggest dream was regarding to jazz and my jazz heroes, my biggest dream was to being able to see those guys on a video because once again, since Cuba and the United States had no relationship, I never expected to see American musicians going to Cuba, even though D.C. Gillespie went in 1977 for the first time, and then in 1979, CBS Records made a huge event, three days event in Cuba called Havana Jam, where they brought a lot of American musicians, and they played for three days in Havana. That was a huge event in 1979. But uh, before that, and even after that, since there was no relationship between the two countries, I thought to see those people just in a video. That was my biggest dream. Then suddenly, in 1980, I moved to the United States, 
and I started playing with Dizzy Gillespie, and that gave, then gave me the reputation, and I started playing with almost all my heroes. So from my point of view, being a Cuban, that for many people, the way people see Cubans or see people from different countries in the music business, I'm supposed to be, I was supposed to be playing congas and timbales. Yeah. And I came to this country to play trap drums and to play the music that was created in the United States because jazz is a United States national art form. So yeah. in, my, in that regard, from my point of view, man, I made it. And I Absolutely. made it big because I came from a tiny island that had no jazz tradition. And I came to the, the to the biggest country in the world where the jazz was created and made a name for myself playing jazz. Absolutely. So that for me it is great. In the other hand, I don't feel so happy that there are still people that I want to think that they are ignorant. They want it. They don't want or they don't know what I have done. Or they don't want to recognize or they don't know what I have done. So for yeah. a lot of people, every time they put my name somewhere, oh, Ignacio Barro is going to play, immediately they put on the line a note, the great Afro-Cuban drummer. But yeah. they don't put any relationship to Dizzy Gillespie, to Clyde Terry, to Chick Corea, to Bakoy Kainer. No, 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 the great Afro-Cuban drummer. And I always tell people, listen, man, I'm proud. I'm Cuban and I'm black. But I came to this country to play straight ahead jazz, and my case has been proven. Don't mislead people because people, the audience who doesn't know who Ignacio Barroa is, they go to the concert thinking that they're going to see a guy playing conga drums. Right. And then they're going to feel disappointed when they, the concert begins and they see a guy playing straight ahead jazz. So yeah. you, better, you better tell them the truth. Yes, I'm an Afro-Cuban guy who came to the United States and became a jazz drummer. And my name has been associated with the greatest jazz drummers in history. Yeah. So I think that that's something that has to do maybe with uh, the resistance of some people to admit that the guy, that a Cuban guy has become a jazz drummer in the same way that a lot of people in this country weren't ready to have a black president. Yeah. Probably so. So yeah. I hope that I that at some point don't get me wrong, there are a lot of people that knows and they recognize me as a great jazz drummer, but there are other per percentage of the people that they continue insisting, Oh Ignacio is a great Afro Cuban jazz drummer, oh Ignacio Afro Cuban, Afro Cuban and I think that they just being ignorant. Or yeah. or I don't know if they can come to terms that uh, I'm a jazz drummer. Absolutely. Well Speaking of jazz and being a drummer, I want to ask very simply, why do you love jazz? Man, it's something that I can't explain because I can't explain what happens to me when I heard Nat King Cole singing When I Fall in Love. That's the music. It is something that struck me and it's something that I cannot explain. Why? Because check this out it was not i was not listening to gene krupa body rich or mac roach and i went like wow i like that that style of drumming i heard a guy singing and that struck me and i said man i love that music why i don't know then later on it became something i got let's say i just got infected <laughs> yeah i got absolutely. that infection and, and and i like jazz because it's a it's the music where I can express myself the most. It is a music where everybody improvises, even though that, in my opinion, it is debatable. When people say, oh, jazz is freedom. Yeah, it's freedom, but it has rules, like this country. Yeah, we, we live in a free country, but, uh, we, but there are rules. There are some rules. Um, it is also debatable for many people if we live in a free country or not. Uh, but so the same thing with jazz, because if jazz is a free, it's free expression up to certain point. But I like that genre a lot. Yeah, I can't give you an explanation why. I don't know, but that's the music of my passion. It's yeah. something 
that I can explain. Wonderful. So everyone has a perception of who you are, your family, your friends, your fans. But who do you think you are? When you wake up and face the day and go out into the world, who are you? Wow. Well, since my, since my mother and my grandmother are not here to talk about me, I have to do, I have to do so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think about me, man, I, I'm, I'm a guy who made it. I'm a yeah. guy who made it. I'm a guy that I have been blessed. God gave me the opportunity of coming to the country that I always wanted to come. God gave me the opportunity, and I took or made the best of that opportunity. So I'm a guy who made it. I'm a guy that in May 25th, 1980, jumped, jumped out of a boat in Key West, started a new life. They didn't know a word of English. Um, I made it. What else? Listen, man, it, it, it doesn't sound good that I said this, but I want. let's think about it. I'm the only foreigner drummer who has come to this country and has made a career as a drummer yeah. playing jazz. Because before me, Airito Moreira came from Brazil and played drums for a while with Chick Corea Return to Forever. I think he recorded one album, Return to Forever, played with Chick, but then he made a career as a percussionist. Yeah. Alex Acuna came from Peru and he played with Weather Report for a short period of time and he recorded the, that great album, Heavy Weather. But Alex Acuna continued making his career as a percussionist. I'm the only drummer that has come from any country in the world I played with Dizzy Gillespie for 10 years and have made a career in the United States playing trap drums. Yeah. That's me. So that's yeah. what I think about me. Like I said, yo, I'm very happy with, with, for me, mission accomplished. Without a doubt. Dream realized, man. That's, dream, that's a beautiful. Dream, dream realized with a lot of effort because people also, when people see me play, playing, they just probably see me, oh, Ignacio, what a lucky guy, but they don't know what I went through. It's like yeah. the, what I tell musicians now, they, they complain about but the payment, oh, man, why I cannot make the same money that you make? And I tell them, where were you when I was in New York playing for $40 and $50? Yeah. And sometimes for three dollars because we were fifteen guys who were playing for the door and at the end we got three dollars each. Yeah. Where were you when I was paying my dues? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Without a doubt. You gotta pay your dues, man. For sure. Exactly. So that's what I think about me. Man, mission accomplished. Dream that's accomplished right. and I thank God every day. He gave me an scholarship in the in, to come to the United States to learn to play jazz. And I made the best out of it. And it's not over yet until he called me to go with him. Um, I want to continue, even though it is very hard nowadays. It is very hard. We all know that it's very hard. You have no record company support, so forth and so on. This record, straight ahead from Havana, I did it by myself. So I had to pay for everything, for radio promotion, for everything, for a studio. I pay for everything. And then I'm trying to get someone who helped me, meaning a booking agency that wants to push my product out there, which is very hard because also being a drummer, we drummer always has been seen as a second class citizen. Historically, historically, yeah. for example, a lot of people doesn't know that Buddy Rich is quite a few times when had to stop the band and had to close close his club in New York and he was helped twice by his great friend Frank Sinatra. Yeah. Being one of those times uh the end of his career. Frank Sinatra bailed him out. Yeah. Uh the only drummer, jazz drummer that was able to make a career as a drummer as a band leader were Blakey with the Jazz Messenger. Because you know if you if you take a look, Blakey was always surrounded by best the best. Yes. Blakey and Elvin Jones. But we all, all drummers, we are always seen like we are the people in the back. Yeah. They just yep. pay attention to the front line, whomever is at the front line. And the drummer, yeah, he's just the drummer. 
also another deal of ignorance because people doesn't realize that the drummer is the most important part in that band. Not me. Yeah. Miles Davis said many years ago, when I put a band together, the first thing I look for is the drummer. Because if yeah. the drummer is happening, the band is happening. Yeah. That was Miles Davis' conception. And I totally agree with him on that. So it is very hard, Joe, to 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 make a living and trying to play with your band because people think, oh, but he's just a drummer. It is it is a misconception. It is something that we have to fight for. Um, and I'm going to continue into that fight. That's the fight that I'm fighting right now. Not just trying to be recognized as a jazz drummer, but also being able to play and put what I have out there. Absolutely. So let's see what happens. It's not easy because, for example, I, I got... I'm experienced on that on this because when I did my album Code in 19, in 2017, Code was nominated to a Grammy for a Grammy, uh, won an award in, in in Denmark as the jazz, the best jazz international album, and it was mm, recorded for Blue Note record, the most prestige prestigious uh, jazz label, and I wasn't able to get a booking agent. Wow! Wow! <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> I was in Naval and I called everybody and everybody yeah. said, No, nah, you know, I got too many people. The same excuses, but then you see that later on they hired other people. Even yeah. some booking agents here has hired bands from Cuba playing what they call quote unquote jazz. But they ha they they haven't hired me. I don't know. That's wild. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, at the end of the day, you're always putting out a good product. You've realized your dreams. I appreciate you opening up about your life, not only in Cuba, but here in America. Good luck with the new album, and thank you for opening up. I appreciate it. Thank you for playing my music, man. I hope, I hope that someday my travel takes me to Kansas City, and I can play there for you guys. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Cuba, New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Ignacio for his time, honesty, and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.